Hello and welcome. My name is Ariana Cap, and you have found arisbaseblog.com and you're watching the base bits and this is base bit number one. Um, my name is Ariana Cap, and if you'd like to find out more information about who I am, what I do as a player, as an educator, please just click below. There are some resources for you there. I um, call these this particular part of my blog, the base bits. They are bite-sized video lessons that will demonstrate concepts laid out in my book. My book is called Music Theory for the Bass Player and it recently came out. And um, maybe you're here because you've scanned this code or have seen reference in the book um, about our space blog. So welcome and thank you for being here and what is, what is it about? So I uh, we'll go through, as I said, uh, through concepts laid out in this book. And I want to tell you a little bit about this book and how it came about. I um, originally wanted to write a different book, a book about the pattern system, which is a systematic way to get the fretboard under your belt. Um, and and it's coming. <laughs> but as I was preparing for it and pulling uh, all the material that I've used for many years with my students, I realized I wanted to use music theory terms such as scales and certain intervals and modes and um, triads and chords and so forth. And uh, I was looking for a book that I could point to that would lay out music theory on the fretboard. So as I was doing research about um, music theory books, I realized that a lot of music theory books are not really about the music that bass players typically play. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there. And oftentimes they are geared towards... Uh, maybe a classical piano player, or they're just kept in general terms. And to me, I think music theory can be really integrated if you do it on the instrument. Um, when you... F a lot of my students kept voicing things akin to, well, there's this extra thing called music theory that it's almost like it's killing my creativity or it's taking away from what I want to do or express on the instrument. And... Um, I was thinking a lot about that, and I think part of why that comes about is maybe because the learning of the music theory happens disconnected from the fretboard. So uh, I, I wanted to address that. The other thing I wanted to address is that sometimes bass players might not be that great of readers because um, a lot of bass players come to the instrument through learning shapes or picking um, bass lines off of a recording, and they are not maybe used to reading score very well. And if you try to learn to read at the same time as you're trying to understand music theory, that's a big chunk to bite off. And also, in my view, it's a different skill. So a lot of music theory books, because they have a different goal, they start with, okay, this is a whole note, this is a half note, and uh, before you know it, you're into pages and pages of arpeggios and scales that you're required to read. And to me, it's a bit of a missed opportunity because you you might be st struggling with, uh, with just the plain reading part of it, and reading is an extremely vital skill, absolutely needs to be studied. However, if you know music theory, number one, reading gets much easier. So I would do it the other way around. I would learn music theory first and reading second. And <coughs> the other argument is that um, a lot of bass players learn through shapes. They learn through listening, picking things off the recording, or they learn through uh, you know, certain shapes that they get under their fingers and then uh, execute them and move them around on the bass. And uh, it's a missed opportunity to study music theory without really addressing these shapes. So that was a bit of the background of why I wrote this book, because I wanted to address all of that. My book doesn't rely on standard notation. I do use tab once in a while because I use tiny little bit of standard notation, but it's mostly for some examples and they are optional. And um, mostly I rely on fretboard diagrams because they're visual representations of what we actually do. And as I was doing that, I realized just how important fingering and technique are. So this book has an extensive section on fingerings and technique and um, um, the best, because good technique is 
very important for good sound. And while I don't want to tell you exactly how to hold your finger, as everybody has a different physique and is put together differently, there are some principles that can really help you and also some exercises that can help you accelerate your playing, lead to more uh, relaxed playing, and uh, can also make sure that you don't injure yourself and get any kind of long-term effects from playing this, you know, instrument which is heavy and, and, and has some physical components to it so it's all about relaxation feeling into your body and finding what works for your specific body and I have a lot of tips techniques exercises and um, and uh, photos in the book that describe um, what I'm what I'm talking about and I also have an extension st extensive section about how to help you change your habits uh, should you have bad habits because I I, I, I hear that request a lot. So, uh, yeah, I want to get started. That was just a little bit of background. And today is bass bit number one. So in my blog, I will be doing lots of different things. But the bass bits, they are reserved for music theory for the bass player. And we'll be going through chapter by chapter and uh, or concept by concept. Now, you don't absolutely need the book to follow along. Um, but what I'm doing here is just a tiny... Uh, or a small part of what is in the book. And I should also mention, if you would like to study at length with me, I do longer videos and they are going to be available in my classroom. So please, again, check the resources below if you'd like to uh, study with me or go more into uh, a little bit more into depth uh, about some of these concepts, then you can do that as well. All right, so I'm going to be starting very basic and I'm going to be moving along quite fast. So if you're a beginner, need to rewind, need to read things up in the book, that might be a good way to go. If you're an advanced player, uh, there might be some ways here to think about stuff that you've never thought about in a certain way or some exercises that actually might, might be quite challenging even if you are a seasoned player. So very basically, there are seven notes in the musical alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then it repeats. That's one thing to know. The other thing to know is that between E and F, and B and C is a half step. Half step in our Western tonal system is the shortest distance. And a half step for a bass player is in its simplest form, there's more to say about that, but in its simplest form is just going up or down a fret. Half step up, half step down. Whole step, double the whole thing. Whole step up, whole step down. There are open strings, different strings, we'll get to that. Um, so, but for now, that's that's number one that we need to know. The next thing are sharps and flats. So if between all the letter names, for example, between A and B are whole steps, that means there's a half step in between, right? And that one is named by either using a sharp or by using a flat. Sharp, like a point, goes up, okay? So if I say A sharp, then the note gets higher. Higher is this way. Higher is whoops, the camera doing funny things, is this way, and higher is also this way. So for a beginner, this is extremely confusing because this is exactly opposite as it is in space, right? But in music, we go by sonically, by what we're hearing, and this way notes get higher, and typically this way notes get higher. There are also, of course, if we involve different strings, that's not always true, but we'll get to that. So um, half steps, as I was saying, between E and F, B and C, all the other half steps we create by using sharps and flats. I can take a sharp, make my A sharp to get me in between A and B, or I can take the B and make a flat to lead to a B flat. So what? here's an exercise for you. Um, you're going to go up the E string, saying every single note name as you go up. E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. So far, so good. Now you're going down. And you notice I'm doing this in tempo. And that's extremely important. If you don't do it in tempo, this is what's going to happen. E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. Think, 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 right? In those think, 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 pauses. You're cheating yourself out of the practice. What I recommend you do is you find <coughs> your slowest, your toughest spot, and that gives you that tempo. If between B and C is hard, 
then and you need to think about it for a second then you need to give yourself more time now i always do these exercises with a metronome and i recommend really really recommend you do them religiously with a rec metronome because without it you're cheating yourself out of the success of the exercise you actually training yourself to have bad or sloppy timing for one and you're also training yourself to think there's oh let's try i'll figure it out you know in music the best skill you can train yourself to do is the skill to think ahead in time because music happens in time if you you don't know that after a uh, or after a follows a sharp if you don't know it in time, if you don't know it in time, it doesn't matter if you know it three notes later because the rest of the band will have moved on. So that's why um, I highly, highly recommend to not cheat yourself out of that in this type of exercise. If it's too hard, you just take the tempo down. And I recommend rather than setting the metronome to a glacial tempo of 40 where it's like tick, talk, you know, you don't really get a sense of a of the beat although there are great exercises to do with that sort of metronome setting as well but um for this kind of exercise set it to a tempo 70 or 80 where you really get a nice sense of a beat going by and then if that's too fast you let two beats go by so you would go e click f click f sharp click g click or you let two beats go by if that's too fast e click click f click click and during that time you think about it you think what's next f sharp think think what's next oh g okay that's easy g sharp is next you know if you need four clicks that's fine uh wherever you are but don't cheat yourself out of don't go oh i'm i'm rocking it down here and once i'm getting up here it's slowing me down a little bit that means you're not doing yourself a favor so i really highly recommend that keep the metronome going let it go by three or four beats and um and you will be forced to be consistent and you'll be forced to be in time, which are all great skills to have. And you'll be forced to think ahead. So in that pause where that metronome goes click, 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 you think ahead what's coming next. So going up with sharps, we've done that. <coughs> so far, so good, excuse me. And then we go down saying flats, easy. E, E flat, D, D flat, C, B, B flat, A, A flat, G, G flat, F, and E. All right? For completeness sake, I should say that there's also such a thing as a double sharp and a double flat. We will see later where we might need that. However, for now, um, just know that an F double sharp will take you up a whole step. All right? So an F double sharp is basically a G. Okay? Also, you may have noticed these guys in between the whole steps, they have two note names, F sharp or G flat. That's called enharmonic. That's a really good term to know. It can be called, it's enharmonically and F sharp is a G flat. Okay, it's just a matter of how I look at it. And as you learn more music theory, you will realize it's actually much, much easier to know how to name things correctly because they make much more sense and they feel like a chunk of knowledge that you can plug into rather than uh, something you have to think about. It'll be automatic to think in certain ways, in certain keys that there are sharps and in other keys there are flats and it will be much easier because you're not picking out single notes, you're sort of plugging into a pool of knowledge which is a scale, for example. Um, all right, now I'm going to step this up one more time, and this is where it may, may, may get a little harder. Now we're going to go up again and saying everything that's not just the letter name, but something that needs a sharp or a flat because I'm in between things. I'm going to give that a flat name as I go up. So let's do that. So my click's running, and I'm going to go E, F, G flat, G, A flat, A, B flat, B, C, D flat, D, E flat E and you guessed it going down we're gonna do the reverse so now it's gonna be sharp so E D sharp D C sharp C B A sharp A G sharp G F sharp F E all right if you want to step it up one more time how about we say it going up with all sharps including double sharps it's just a great mental exercise <laughs> to get your seven notes in gear, all right? D double sharp, E sharp, F sharp, F double sharp, G sharp, G double sharp, A sharp, A double sharp, B sharp, C sharp, C double sharp, D sharp, D double sharp. And going now, we're going to do everything in flats and double flats. F flat, E flat, 
E double flat, D flat, D double flat, C flat, B flat, B double flat, A flat, A double flat, G flat, G double flat, and F flat. Do that on all of your strings, just for the heck of it. It's fun. It's a brain twizzer. And uh, up your tempo, set a metronome. You'll come up with lots of variations for this. I highly recommend it. It's an interesting exercise. And it will help you get the fretboard down. Now, next bass bit, I'm going to show you that if you think you knew the alphabet, maybe you don't. <laughs> We're going to scramble up the alphabet in wicked ways. What does it do? It helps you understand how notes relate to each other and that is a very useful thing to know especially when we when we go further using those note names so on the fretboard knowing them and saying them and realizing how they relate to each other that's going to be the topic for next week thank you so much for tuning in welcome again to the bass bits i love hearing from you please leave me a comment let me know if you have any questions uh, down below or on the side somewhere there are comment buttons so please let me let me hear from you uh, I love knowing how it's going and I will see you at the next base bit